Hi there, I am Robin Thompson. I'm a nonprofit consultant. I'm based here in Eagle County, Colorado. A lot of you all know me, but um, today we have people that are with us from all over the country. I don't think we have anyone internationally today. Um, and what I do is I help people who help people. And this nonprofit learning series is in its fourth year where we bring you cutting edge nonprofit topics and it's free of charge to nonprofits. And I do it free of charge because it's a labor of love for me. We're very fortunate to be sponsored by the Vail Valley Partnership, Mountain Youth and U.S. Bank. So today's topic, I, I really am excited about the panel that we have today because with all that we have been through in this last year, that whole piece about marketing and, and how do we get the word out there and how do we get heard above the noise. And so what this topic is going to be about today is creating and marketing your nonprofit's case for support. And for those of you that know me, you know I get on my soapbox about a case for support. And your case statement needs to be more than a one page document. Most of the ones I do, even for small nonprofits, are about 17 pages long. And people challenge me on that and say, no one's going to read it. But I have had it demonstrated over and over again that, of course, some people won't read it, but some do. And those who do are going to be your advocates if it's done well. So that's why we're going to talk to this panel of experts today about how to be sure you're crafting and marketing your case for support, whether it's in video, audio, whether it's on social media. And so we're so fortunate to have such great talent to learn from as we've been visiting this morning, just right before we start. I'm just, I'm so excited. And the hour and a half that we have is just not going to even be enough. I know that. Um, so here's our panel. Let me introduce them. First off, we have Ben Dodd. Give a big wave there, Ben. He works for the Bell Valley Partnership. And by the way, it's the national, got the national award for the Chamber of Commerce of the Year. He's the content marketing manager who is responsible for member marketing benefits, website and social media management, as well as organizational and program branding to support Bell Valley nonprofits and businesses. He graduated from North Carolina State University in 2009 with a bachelor in graphic design. His background and experience spans from nonprofits, public and private sectors, as well as entrepreneurship. You can find Ben spending time with his family, and he has a new nine-month-old little baby. Um, and uh, I'm going to tell you about JK here in just a minute because their two little kids are eight and a half and nine months old and they're friends in daycare. Is that cool? <laughs> um, he films for Capture the Action video productions and he plays sports and lives an outdoor lifestyle. And then we have Claire Heffron. Claire, give a big wave. She is the contract executive director for a nonprofit, Sacred Cycle. And she's also the founder and CEO of Colossum, which is a purpose-driven branding agency. She's led creative teams in Chicago, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. She's trained in flow state and enjoys integrating it into her professional life and athletic pursuits. She's committed to community and climate advocacy, and her life purpose is to daringly advocate for access to nature, for inspiration and healing. So thank you for being here, Claire. And then last but not least, we have J.K. Perry. He is the executive director for a nonprofit High Five Access Media, and he's been there since 2007. They provide community coverage of local government meetings, free access to media, education, facilities and camera gear, television and internet distribution, low cost production services and unique productions. They do a lot with nonprofits. They are extremely busy right now helping nonprofits because we're trying to get things out there on video and we're trying to get on social media. And so um, he moved to the Vail Valley in 2005 after attending the University of Iowa, where he studied, studied journalism and photography while working at the Daily Iowan. He interned at the Cedar Rapids Gazette covering public safety and wrote for the Vail Daily after moving to Colorado. He is also a Chicago native 
and hardware, hardcore Windy City sports fan. He enjoys deep dish pizza, riding Harleys, fly fishing, hunting, and reading. He and his wife Erin live in Edwards with their two cats, Frank and Adonis, and their new little baby. Um, so for those of you that are out there, if you can, be sure you mute yourself and then you'll be able to unmute later and um, you can turn on your videos or off your videos, whatever works best for you. And as you go through, if you have questions, if you want to put them in the chat box, I'll be monitoring those. We can ask questions along the lines. You, those of you that have attended the nonprofit learning series know that I ask a bunch of questions. And uh, so if some comes up, we might not have time to answer them as we go through, but we'll definitely have time at the end. And you also know that up in the upper right hand corner of your screen, you can put it on speaker view so that you'll see one of the panelists if, if you want to see them and, and not be distracted by um, the other videos on the screen. So let's get started. Background of what the media can do for nonprofits. So let's just dive right in with whoever wants to start with giving us some backgrounds on what your thoughts are about nonprofits gaining any type of media exposure in this world we've been living in right now with COVID and, and fingers crossed that we're coming out of COVID. Which one of you wants to get started? Okay, Ben, I know, I know. Oh, there, Claire goes. Go ahead, Claire. I say, you know, before before we go into like, there's a zillion things you can do, which there are always a zillion things you can do, and the world right now is super reactive and squirrely, and there's so much is coming at you. I will always say I'm a strategist. Is what is your foundation, mm -hmm. and how do you choose? Don't try to do everything. Narrow it. Maybe a three-year plan. A three-year plan can't do it this year. We don't have the capacity or the budget spread it out and then really lay a foundation and thoughtfully move forward. Great advice. Ben, what would you say to that? Um, what I have, uh, I've taken some notes uh, to try to plan out my thoughts here. Um, but if you have a message to share, um, you need to get it out there to the right distribution channels that reach your target audience. Um, so the question is, who are you trying to get in front of? Um, so, um, you know, with that, you know, to gain media exposure, I think you have to have something to share um, and something of value. Um, so, you know, the strategy around that is what is your why and what's your end goal? Um, so that, and your end goal is not, I'm going to get 20 uh, new donors. Like that's not an end goal. The end goal is I'm going to tell my story um, or tell this person's story so that they understand what we do. Um, so don't let your end goal be profit driven. Let your end goal be about what it is that you're trying to do with your nonprofit. And then the donations will come later. Wow. Great advice, both of you all. And JK, what about you with the video production that, that you're doing now? What, what are you trying to help people understand with to get that media exposure? Well, I want to, you know, I want to jump onto what, what Claire said and just, um, you know, reiterate it's, I think it's all really hard uh, for us nonprofits. You know, I work for an organization that just has, you know, two or three people. And I think that when we look at marketing and media, it, it just seems very overwhelming. There's a lot of different directions that we can go, but really it helps to you know, come up with a plan and figure out where are the best places for you to be sharing your message and really you know, start small, focus on one or two places, get some experience, do some experimenting, and then you can find out what works for you and you can sort of expand upon that. Um, you know, I think that we're pretty lucky here in the Valley and I know some other folks are, are from outside the Valley, but we're pretty lucky to have a really great uh, media environment. You know, we've got the Vale Daily, which is a successful newspaper and not a, a lot of communities can't say that. We've been seeing uh, a lot of newspapers across the country who are shutting their doors 
um, because their their uh, business model just isn't profitable anymore. So we're lucky in that way. We're lucky to have um, uh, several great local radio stations as well as high five access media on television for nonprofits to get the word out about their organizations. Great, and JK, talk just a little bit about um, how High Five helps nonprofits get the word out through television, because that's what we're going to work work into here is the difference in organic media and paid media. Um, so tell us a little bit about which, what High Five Access can do for a nonprofit. Yeah, what we do is definitely organic. It's, it's from the bottom up. I think that in a lot of media resources, you'll see uh, sort of have a top down mentality where they're the gatekeepers for you to get your message out to the community. Whereas we at High Five, we don't censor anything. Um, I mean, we have a, a few meager rules that are really easy to navigate. Um, so it's, it's a great uh, resource to take advantage of. And really what we're trying to do is weave together community using your message your advocacy. And, and practically, that means that we're providing resources for you to advocate for yourselves and garner support. Um, and those resources take several shapes. You know, we have um, workshops that are either free or low cost. Uh, we also have video production equipment that's free to check out so that you can create your, uh, your masterpiece. Um, and you can also um, hire us to, um, you know, at affordable rates to produce your, your video. And then all of this can be shared across, you know, so many different platforms. Obviously, we have locally cable uh, channel five on, on the local Comcast cable system, which is available in the upper part of the valley that your video can be shown on. Um, and then we can also get it onto our website and you can share it from there or on your own to social media, Facebook, YouTube, um, whatever you might like. Um, and, uh, you know, as far as some of the production services that we do, we do uh, event coverage, live streaming, documentaries, public service announcements. Uh, there's quite a bit that we do. And so if somebody isn't in this area, how would they look for an open access television channel like what we have here? Because um, nonprofits can put their video on there for free. So what, what might they look for in another area? Really, it's, it's um, you know, it depends upon where they're at. There's, there, there's about 3,000 access centers uh, uh, spread across the country. Um, and um, there's, they've been um, victims to sort of the shrinking of media as well. But you'll find in a lot of communities that there are access centers uh, available to you as a resource. So I would Google, uh, you know, access center or access television and the city where you live, the town where you live, or even the county where you live. Um, some access centers are a little bit different. Some deal really with only government access. So they just do like town council or city council meetings. Others do government and um, public access, which is like what we do. We allow the uh, public, which includes nonprofits, to come in and share their videos to learn about creating media um, and have equipment at their, at their fingertips. So I think, you know, Googling is one way if, if you ever need... Um, help trying to track one down, I can, I can be of help uh, to you. Um, there's not a whole lot of them left in Colorado. Um, Denver Open Media, which was the biggest in, in Colorado recently, um, the, the t city of Denver pulled their funding and um, the city of Denver is now running the access center and it's only really government access any longer. But you might look up the Open Media Foundation in Denver, they might be able to help. Um, there's a lot of nonprofits that that do a similar or have a similar mission um, as as access centers. Great, thank you for that description. Because some of the nonprofits too have locations in other places, so that may help. So since we're talking about organic media being 
organic meaning that we're not paying for it. You know, we, um, we might have people share it or whatever. Uh, ben, I know that you do a lot of helping, um, whether it be the Vell Valley Partnership businesses or nonprofits with that organic piece of media. So, you know, what, what can we learn that we can do to help us get up to the top of the list of nonprofit um, the organic media and social social media because it, it's you know we've just been flooded and you might even have some statistics about you know how many people are on social media that weren't before and you put something on and you're down at the bottom of the, the rung just like that yeah and i i also want to uh, talk a little bit uh build on what claire and jk were talking about with like coming up with a a small plan um and and knowing like start small and knowing the distribution channel. So I think the best thing that um, you can do with um, wherever you live um, is to actually engage with your local chamber. Um, and you can write down all the media channels that you can think of, all of them, and just write who's that target audience for you? Like, who are you reaching if you created a post for this? Or if you created a video for this like who is your target audience um, for those different channels and so you go to the chamber and you say where's access television um, you know we you know if you live in a different area um, you can ask about other media outlets that you know that the chambers will have a pulse on um, you know so they're connected with the business and nonprofit community already they're gonna have that understanding of, here's all the different distribution channels that you need to think of. Plus there's a lot of times media partners will work with chambers and provide a marketing bit of benefit to those members of that chamber. Um, so it's something else to keep in mind. Now with what I do at Bell Valley Partnership with organic media, um, yeah, we, we have our newsletter, uh, we have our um, even our visitor side, we have a newsletter that goes out to visitors who want to come to Vell Valley. Um, we have our websites, and then it, within that is the events page, the, um, the blog posts or press release page, um, and then you have, um, you know, our social media pages. So really, you know, if you're going to create this list, this distribution channel uh, list of, and say like you write a blog, you need to get this out. You wanna share it with the local businesses um, and the local people within your community. Well, you have this press release or this blog or this story. So now you like, where can I just send this press release and get this information out? And so you go through your list of distribution channels and then you, and, and you send it, you send it to Vell Daily, you send it to, you post it on Vell Valley Partnerships website, um, you post it on your own website, you uh, link to it on social media, um, and, and all that's doing is also building that Google search, um, your SEO. So, you know, that content, you're just repurposing and distributing that content, so you don't have to rewrite something for, for every single channel. So what I'm hearing you say is let's repurpose, you know, so do something once and work, work smarter, not harder, and then be able to put it in various locations. Right, right. And so Claire, you know, um, with your branding and um, with your, your background there, and then being executive director, director of a nonprofit, you're probably looking at uh, those various channels between organic media and the paid media, and then the owned media being your websites, et cetera, that you actually own. So, so what, what's your advice there? Mm -hmm. I, I love what Ben was saying about really have a punch list. I think the best thing you can do is to create systems and you can, you can get them from your local resources. Don't cry and create it from scratch. It's really time consuming and exhausting. So he has a list on distribution channels. I recommend a punch list before you ever release, make content go live from a branding standpoint. Does, is the image on point? 
uh, with our quality does is it does it represent one of our three messaging pillars is our key message in it does it have a call to action so this is something that i that i give to so in sacred cycles experience uh, um exa as an example the marketing team is myself leading as marketing director and 11 volunteers so they only have limited time so i don't want them to be am i doing it right am i following the system so we have protocol of my favorite, three favorite words ever in branding. Is it consistent on cadence? We do a blog every Tuesday of the month. Is it polished? Is the tone on, does it sound like us? Does it visually look like us? And is it polished? Does it look professional? There are places to be candid like stories and Instagram that will fall off the radar in 24 hours. But if you're loading something to YouTube, make sure it's professional because it's going to stick around forever. Um, in, in terms of um, social media, I think it's so, you have to be scrappy. And, and I come from a very small nonprofit. So we got to figure out how to do it without budget and to make sure it shows up. And some ideas I have are to create um, what we call an ambassador toolkit. So if your community, whether they work for you, they are ambassador, they're a volunteer, they're a board member, make it easy for them to talk about you so that they're not like, I'm not sure what to say. So we have a downloadable PDF that has cut and paste copy on it, that has links to images that you can download. You can get a sticker for the cap of your bike so that when you're riding, someone sees it. So think of the ways that you can empower your community to share about you so that they're excited. They're like, I want to, but I, I don't know how. Also educate your community. So a lot of people don't understand the algorithms of social media. So we have actually designed graphics that say, if you want to support a nonprofit or a small business, the best thing you can do is hit the save button. You may never look at it again, I don't care. But if you save it, I get a point. I'm gonna call it a point. If you comment on it, I get a point. So you wanna teach them of the, the tiers of what is going to bring you up in the algorithm. Sometimes you're like, why is that post still around? It was three days ago. It's because people are engaging it with it. So don't be shy about being very literal. Don't presume your audience is digitally savvy. Help them, help them to empower them to, to share things. Uh, yeah, let's stop there. That's enough. <laughs> and so, uh, so I'll ask you all, um, where should we be? You know, out of all the, you know, radio, television, newspaper, social media, um, you know, where, where should we as nonprofits be in that whole alphabet soup of where we could be? Uh, ben already told us, you are where your target market is. So you need to define specifically, don't overcomplicate it. So um, the, uh, in my experience um, or example, Sacred Cycle, you are a supporter of a survivor or you want to share our mission. Those are our big buckets who we're speaking to. Then we create sub, sub segments and we say, where do they hang out? So you talk about demographics, psychographics, what is their lifestyle? Are they on Facebook? Are they on LinkedIn? Are they reading the newspaper? Find out where they live and hang out and go stand in front of them, stand in front of them in terms of your pieces. So I'm always gonna start with where, where is your audience and what are you saying to them? Make sure that you specify um, differentiate who you're speaking to with different content. Good. All right. Um, so we need to figure out where that audience is, whether they're, you know, on Instagram or whether they're on Facebook or whether they're on LinkedIn or whether they read the newspaper or, um, and, and I know that when I work with nonprofits, one of the problems is they try to be everywhere and they, you know, they, they think, well, you know, if, if it's good here, then we'll put it here and we'll put it here and we'll put it here. And then we all know what happens, right? None of it gets done because it's too overwhelming. And so what would you all say for where do we start? Claire, you mentioned that you're a small nonprofit. JK, you're a small nonprofit. And Ben, I know you work with small nonprofits. So for those of us that don't have this huge team of marketing people, where do we start? I think, you know, we've just been going through this social media planning phase where, you know, we're really trying to hone where we're uh, reaching folks and which platforms we are on. 
and we had to look at some of some of the ones that um, that we traditionally had been on, but maybe were falling by the wayside because we just couldn't keep up with it, or we realized that it really wasn't hitting who we needed to hit. So we do have limited time. So I think you really have to take a hard look and say, you know, here's one or two platforms that I'll get started with that are reaching the audience that I need to reach and, and focus on those. Don't try to bite off more than you can chew because you start building these things and then folks expect you to be publishing content to them. And then when you stop, they sort of stop following you. Um, so you build up the goodwill, and then if you if you don't uh, continue, then you'll you'll lose those folks. Um, so I would say you know start start small and and pick one or two. You know I, I think you can look at things kind of generally. You know for demographics, like I think we think that you know younger folks are usually on Instagram, and you have sort of Gen X and older on on Facebook. Although there's a lot of you know information out there that young people are still on Facebook. Um, you know, LinkedIn is a great way to reach other professionals. So if you have some sort of service that um, overlaps with, with professionals, you know, get it out there on LinkedIn. Um, you know, Twitter is a great place to get, you know, short little tidbits out um, about your organization. Um, we focus on Instagram and, and Facebook for the most part because um, we found that, that that's where most of our audience is at as far as social media is concerned. Yeah, I would uh, agree that Facebook and Instagram um, are the most used platforms for businesses um, and then uh, users uh, for those demographics that JK was sharing. Um, you can localize those, um, those audiences. Um, you can reach those with paid advertising if you need to, uh, boosting a, a post that does really well. And I can give you some pointers on that too in a second, but um, you know, you have your LinkedIn, that's a professional networking uh, platform. And here's a plug for VVP Connect. You know, we launched VVP Connect and, and all of you, most of you that are in here um, were already put into the nonprofit network uh, group and platform. So that's just a very localized um, um, online platform. Um, and then when you are on YouTube and Twitter, you're starting to reach a national audience. Um, so you can think of it a little bit like that too. And then really um, the time, like you don't have time, if you're a program uh, executive director or, or a program manager and you're running programs, you don't have time to worry about marketing. Um, you don't have time to worry about social media, especially. But what I am seeing that is a good success story is uh, My Future Pathways, what Bratzo is doing. Um, what he's done is he's, he has some ambassadors like Claire was mentioning. So David Garcia is posting as well. And when they're out, um, they're building culture on social media basically. And they're, and they're showing like where the donor's money is going to as well. So it, you're reaching two different audiences when he posts that. He posts a photo of a bunch of kids wearing masks and listening to a mentor talk about, you know, his professional or her professional realm. So he posts this um, instantaneously as it's happening. It's almost like your checklist, like your punch list, like, okay, we need the parents to sign this form. I'm going to take a photo and post it on Facebook or Instagram. Um, and then what's happening is the kids who may want to join My Future Pathways are seeing that. So he's gaining that audience and then um, and probably the parents as well. But then now donors, donors are seeing that culture that's that's being created. So um, and I just, you know, with Facebook buying Instagram, it's really easy now to advertise to both channels. Um, so if you are. If, if you asked us, like, where do we start as a nonprofit? Don't start doing Snapchat and all these things. That, like, you need one person. If one person is to manage these, then don't give them more than two. And, and let them start with Facebook and Instagram because they are connected. You can see the insights who you're reaching. You can be very specific in your boost, who you're reaching, the demographics, 
maybe people who like their page and their friends. So start, start small. And so I'm hearing both, I think, um, Claire and Ben, you all saying that um, Brazzo's group uses volunteers and then Claire, you're, you also use volunteers. So tell us a little bit about how that works and how you keep control of volunteers who may be out there posting something that you might say, eee, how'd that happen? Well, we have, a, we have a system. So we have a spreadsheet that has uh, the, the date that the post is supposed to go live on, the pillar that it's speaking to, program, education, development, the concept, and then the actual copy. When the copy is there, they, they change a drop down that says ready for approval. And then once it's ready for approval, the designer comes and pastes an asset. Now, obviously I have siloed a copywriter, a graphic designer, people that are good at one task. So it goes through several people before it goes live. They also build a trust with me. I provide a style guide for them that says, here's the color palette, here's the tone, here's the hashtags, follow the punch list. And, and so they usually sit down and crank out a, a bunch at once. I think, you know, so and the other thing that's super important with volunteers is it has to be fun and it has to not be overwhelming. And so we do a monthly um, Zoom call with a community. We have five committees. And so each committee has one Zoom call, max an hour, and we make sure to check in with each other as human beings. Um, I think, you know, another really important piece of this that we skipped over with social is, is really what's your, what's your goal, as Ben was saying, like you may not are you building awareness or trying to collect emails? So we don't wanna focus so much on social media and disregard perhaps sending out a newsletter or a blog, the subscribe button, getting people into your bucket so you can market to them and you can learn, you can get the same demographics from a MailChimp or from a Google Analytics and then you can cater your messaging there. So there are certainly tiered, um, subscriptions and there are certainly free options as well but I think it's important to make sure that that in the beginning I would look at all the assets that you might have photo copy blog recordings and go here here's all this great material what should we use it for and what are the good channels that it may be suitable for great um, and so um, the system that you have set up, it has a lot of different checks and measures, it sounds like, so that it's not um, a rogue, that somebody just doesn't come and just, you know, post something. And um, when I worked at a university, that's one of the things that our insurance required of us mm -hmm. because I had student employees and the students were posting. And so we had to have a certain number of checks and balances before that social media could go up just to, for, to satisfy the insurance in case that somebody came back on us for some reason. So, um, so those checks and balances are important. And so um, JK, when, when we talk about um, the types of, of things that we would put in social media. So when you're working with nonprofits and you're, you all are doing videos, you know, we always hear if it bleeds, it leads. And, you know, or we have puppies or kids, <laughs> all of those get attention. But when you're doing these videos, what is it that you help people with, help nonprofits pull out to, you know, because it's not going to bleed and lead. It's not going to be headline news. And some of us have puppies and, and kids, but the most of the nonprofits don't. So how, how, what do you, how do you help them? Uh, you, you know, I, it really is sort of hard to break through the din of social media, um, and 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 it's hard to say, you know, what what is what is going to go viral. Um, a lot of times, you know, we we can't determine what these are in advance. Um, but I think that what we can do is we can look at the people who, who we serve, right? We don't necessarily have puppies and kittens. And I know, I know we don't, and it makes life more difficult, um, but we do help our communities. So, you know, generally speaking, I would say, you know, focus on the stories about the folks who you're helping. So if you're out there and you're serving the community 
and you hear of a particularly interesting story um, from some, someone your organization is helping, write it down, have a notebook. Um, that was something that I used to do as a journalist that anytime I had an idea, I had like an ideas notebook. Anytime I had an idea for a story, I would write it in the ideas notebook. And so that's a great way when you're out in the field so that you don't forget, because I know we always forget, we have that great idea and then it just goes out there. So write it down and um, really focus on, on, on telling those personal stories, those, those human interest stories. And you could do that, you know, ac across different types of content. You know, you can do that with photos, you can do it with uh, writing and language, you can do it with video. Um, so it, I think that, you know, we don't wanna be sensational, but we do want to find an emotional hook for our stories to, to draw people in. And I think that if you do that, you're gonna be more likely to, you know, for, for it to spread on, on social media. Great. And so Ben and Claire, what, what kind of stories um, do you all see that get shared, get liked, get commented on? Yeah, I, I don't think I could have worded it better than what JK just said in terms of uh, the human interest stories. You know, you as a nonprofit, if you look at like the hero's journey, um, hero's journey being like uh, the classic story uh, to tell. Um, and there's so many examples of that, you know, that you as a nonprofit, you're like the wise wizard or the sage or, you know, the, the helper that the friend that helps the hero, which is the people you are serving, your community, um, get through their journey to become the hero. Um, so you're like the Sherpa. Um, I'll just say that it's tough. Like sometimes I think I'm like this, this, post is going to be viral like it's going to be awesome and then it you know four people might have liked it and like all right well back to the drawing board but i think it, you just got to have fun with it um kind of like claire was saying with the volunteers like it, it's social media um but facebook did a report that came out that said what are the top three most engaging uh content uh posts that were created and and people engaged with and it was inspiration so this is kind of the story the the human interest story there's definitely a lot of inspiration in that and um then there's humor so i we are we are so uptight all the time like if you can just throw in some humor every now and then it it's like that comic relief that everyone needs especially now especially now so throw in humor have fun be loose with it um, when it's appropriate. I mean, obviously, like there's a, a fine line to that you should not cross. Um, and then uh, DIY, uh, do it yourself kind of stuff. So, for example, like, um, you know, I'm just, we're here with Claire and, and Claire works on a very serious type of uh, program that's very uh, beneficial to so many women. And and what she has though is like that DIY kind of things, tips for other people who are suffering um, and say like, here's some step, easy steps that you can take, do it yourself kind of steps. Um, you know, so it's not about the nonprofit, like giving me money and you know, all that. It's like, I'm here to help you. Like I, it's about you that I'm trying to help. So um, DIY humor and then um, inspiration. Great advice. And Claire, you know, uh, with what you do and, and other nonprofits on here, I know um, similar to them. I mean, when we talk about the personal stories like that JK and Ben were talking about, you know, the people that you work with, you might, they might want to be anonymous. I mean, so how do you tell the story of somebody who may, um, you know, you, you don't want to advertise who they are or they may not want to be advertised. So how do you do that? Yeah, absolutely. So let me back up because some people may not know who Sacred Cycle is. So Sacred Cycle uh, was founded in Carbondale, Colorado, received 501c3 in 2016, and we provide healing for female identifying adults who are survivors of sexual assault or abuse through the unique programming of therapy, mountain biking, and community. So yeah, deep topic, huh? I, you know, I, I've done a presentation to an organization at 8 a.m. 
And all of a sudden I went, oh my goodness, like glazed over, what are we talking about over coffee? So I may be used to the conversation and I'm involved in it because I, there one in four women in the country that will experience it in her lifetime. So I look to how can we find them and help? And, and as, as JK was saying, it's so crucial on community. So really it's not only we can, we can impact X number of people through our programming, but for every survivor, there are, there are her family and there are her fellow friends that are bike riders. So we really build it on awareness. We, we, have, we um, are required to use HIPAA. So our participants are confidential. Not even the board members know who they are. Um, you know, and, and so we have a clinical team that works with the participants. So we have to, it's a challenge for sure. It's a deep topic and it's confidential. So, you know, I have visions, I'm a creative and I have visions of like feet swinging over a table in their biking shoes. So I call those micro moments. And the same thing that JK said is, I'm constantly remembering conversation I have, little snippets. So if you can create a thread, and for us it's the before, before the after, the wink of the eye when they catch you at a community ride. And I know they're a survivor, but no one else does. So we capture those. We also tell the story of the powering of the survivor. So how, you know, what are the hard facts and how do we make it fun and put some levity to it? We don't necessarily joke, but we say, hey, we're, we're a board that likes to ride bikes and drink beers and, and we, we handle it straight on with empathy. So if you look at your organization's values, how does that show in your branding and your marketing and in the conversations that you have? Great. And so um, I know that some of the organizations here, you know, some have something to do with the environment. OK, so they're not um, affecting one person, but the environment or, um, you know, something besides a person. What would you all suggest as to, you know, how how do we tell that story? I, you know, I think we've run into this before ourselves because we've done videos on organizations that are helping the environment and I think you have to you have to tie the environment to people so if you clean up Gore Creek it's going to um, you know help clean up your drinking water um, lots of fishermen come to Vail and spend money to, to go fishing on fishing licenses, on fishing gear. Um, so you have, to, you have to humanize it somehow. How does it affect humans? But you know, what gets lost in that environmental discussion is the environment for the sake of the environment. You know, it, you have to you know, give it the human value, but you have to you know, give it the intrinsic value at the same time and let people know that, you know, rivers should flow freely for the sake of themselves, you know, and, you know, putting humans off to the side. Um, so, yeah, it can be challenging, but yeah, you want to humanize it, I think, and then, you know, talk about the intrinsic value as well. That's a really cool thing, um, JK. I, uh, JK, I, I heard something that said um, uh, humanity got in trouble when we separated ourselves from nature. We are part, we are just one of the river is its, its own being on its own, um, but the humanization of it, uh, yeah, perfect. I, I, um, we recently did a, a, like a short video story on, for the Eagle River uh, Watershed Council, and, and it was in the perspective of the river, um, so, um, and water, so the, the title of it's I Am Water. Um, and I had a friend uh, do a spoken spoken word poem um, that she, I mean, I can't speak like this and, and she can, she can pull out these emotions um, and say things in a way that really connect people to like appreciating water and the perspective of water. And I think of the giving tree. Um, so like, can you, can you make, or Ishmael, I read the book Ishmael. So like, can you make um, an animal or the environment like like a person almost but that's kind of what um, JK is talking about is it's difficult but 
there's different ways of doing it and we all use this. So how does it affect us? And what are the things that we need to know to protect it? Um, just like you would want to protect your grandmother or grandfather. Wow, great. Yeah, so um, I think that puts us back in that place of what we were kind of talking about is, you know, what's our goal here? Our goal is to help educate people on what we do so that then they'll want to be a part of it. They'll want to be involved. And I, I think one of the things that we've kind of been dancing around as we talk about media is branding and, um, you know, helping our nonprofits stand out because a lot of people, especially in Eagle County, they confuse the nonprofits. They confuse who does what? Oh, they, they work with kids. Oh, no, no, they, they work with adults. Oh, no, you know, so there's a lot of confusion around that. And so what would you all suggest for the branding of the nonprofit to help them stand out above the crowd so that people understand what that nonprofit does? You guys want me to go first? <laughs> yeah, you go, go ahead. <laughs> how do you differentiate so what are there 120 more than that ben do you know how many there are in the in eagle county 243 but who's oh goodness i'm way off i've the double what i know i thought yeah um it, it is differentiating and i think we've mentioned several pieces of this so do you have a style guide um, before you even get a style guide how did you what does your logo mean so i never just design a pretty picture there is psychology of the color that you use and what does the color of the logo convey? What is the meaning behind it? What is your, your tagline is all, so branding um, simply is the five senses plus intuition, making that tangible. So to look and look at those and look at the um, uh, consistent, memorable, polished. So applying that in there, the this a strategy of a brand is what I look for of before we create any identity and any words, uh, Ben mentioned archetypes. What is the, the character that we are portray, portraying? What is the tone? You wanna to study the marketplace. Who are your perceived competitors? Now, I don't believe in competitors, but I believe in, in organ, organizations that can collaborate together. So who might we bond with to work with together? There's an amazing model out there where you put together a brand, a nonprofit and a celebrity. And that model today where the, the celebrity brings light to the organization and the brand provides the story and then the nonprofit reaps the benefits of the donations of it. So I think it is, um, for me, before I ever start pushing anything out, it is what is that foundational brand strategy? How do we differentiate ourselves, some things that others do not do? And then how do we bring that story to the table with a, a consistent message? Yeah, I'm not gonna pretend to be a marketing guru, um, you know, so, I just, I would say that we went through a rebrand in 2016 and, and it, it was really helpful. I think that it has helped us in the community and helped people understand who it is and what we do and we're more recognizable. But, you know, practically, how do you accomplish that if you have a limited budget? So, you know, look out into the community and try to you know find the resources that you have you know find a marketing person who has the experience and can guide you through um doing a rebrand if that's what you want to do or finding a new logo um you know honing your mission find someone who's willing to help you for you know for for free or for um you know for very little um I think practically, you know, that's that's a great way to, um, you know, take advantage of the resources that you have at, at hand. Yeah. I, uh, sorry. Go ahead. I just ben. wanted to, I just wanted to add um, to that. You know, J.K. is a storyteller. So if you're having trouble with like being getting your message out 
he he yes he's a videographer and can create this story for you but he's also doing some consulting there to pull out your why and your value and and making it human uh, humanizing the the story so to speak so you can take like his advice on the story and apply it to some of the other social media um, strategies that you may have and the only thing i would say um is to be genuine um to um not just be like so like scripted or or portray this like light like be transparent um you know i, I think people appreciate transparency and and when people are humble um but uh, you know and then everything that claire said <laughs> I have a handful of free free or low resource ideas. And I don't just suggest these to people that are small or starting out. You are never too old to utilize knowledgeable resources. And sometimes I think we're like, oh, I have staff now, we got it going on. I don't need to ask anybody else. I am continually just enamored. And in fact, I spend half a day a week just learning as I call it to, because I think it connects back to the business and inspires me. So I recommend that. But my, my list of suggestions, get interns. Um, Colorado Mountain College, I have interns both for Sacred Cycle and Collison through University of Boulder, the lead school of business. Um, you, you, can you can choose your rate that you pay them. Um, the Small Business Development Center, awesome free resources. Uh, bring advisors onto your board. So that's something that we didn't have prior to me coming on as executive director. So an advisor is, you know, an expert in their field or their arena, but they may not have the time or the desire to be doing the work. So for us, they they come on because they have an expertise in an area and they're per, they're used per need. So I recommend building up your advisory board, and then they can frequently roll into a board of directors position. It's it's more of a commitment to do that. So we do that. Also consider um, capstone projects. So for students in their senior year, it, previously it was called a thesis or maybe it's both, but they, um, I've been approached twice about, can we interview you and maybe take on your nonprofit or your agency as a project? So they come in, you say, I have problems in these areas. Can you help me solve it? And so that's through school. There are also similar organizations that deliver, instead of a financial grant, they deliver a service project grant. So Sacred Cycle was awarded uh, the Roaring Fork Leadership Service Grant. And this was what I had, I think I'd just come into executive director and I sort of abandoned marketing and was like, oh gosh, what's gonna happen to that committee? So I asked for a brand audit and a rebuild. And they spent four or five months, a team of eight professionals looked at our brand and they had specific deliverables that was free so that's a great resource as well and then also google offers a google nonprofit grant they basically um you just have to apply it's quite simple if you have a google account under your nonprofit you can apply and get ten thousand dollars of free google ads now they will not design them or give you the strategy but they will give you the free space so there's some opportunities out there for some free resources and, and I, I was just going to say, you know, tagging on the Google, there's Google for nonprofits for those of you who, who don't know it. And it, it's got a host of apps that you can use, you know, for free. Um, it's, it's pretty easy to sign up and you can use, you know, Google Calendar, Gmail, um, groups. Um, there's so many different things, uh, Google Analytics that you can use uh, for your organization that are, are great. Um, to use. Uh, obviously, we're all giving Google our information, um, but it, they are very, very helpful. And the AdWords is also helpful, as Claire said. Okay, so talk a little bit more about that. And Ben, you may weigh in here too about that, um, the Google piece of it. So Google's free for all of us, right? Um, but is it the Google suite then that you can get for free as a nonprofit? It's not free, but it's a low cost. Low cost, okay. And so um, then talk a little bit about um, what the Google Analytics look like, what they can do for us, what we should be looking for. Should we be advertising on Google? Talk just a little bit about that. What I love about Google Analytics is that um, you can find what your audience finds valuable from your organization. 
So instead of assuming that, um, okay, for example, we, we do Visit Vail Valley, um, visitvailvalley.com. So I go on there and I'm seeing that they go to uh, summer events, um, family uh, travelers and um, first timers. Um, but events was like, wow. So people are really looking for these events to do while they're planning their trip. Um, and so, you know, that's a value and that's something that you can build off of with Google Analytics. And uh, the best metaphor I ever heard um, is um, in reference to when you have something of value that maybe it went super viral on social media or it is the most visited page by far none of, or maybe it's a blog post that you see on Google Analytics. So that's your unicorn. Um, so here's the analogy. So you wanna make unicorn babies. You wanna get similar content out in all your channels because you know that this is a value, but sometimes you have a donkey and that's the post I was telling you about where I thought for sure there's gonna be a unicorn and then it was a donkey. And so you just don't throw, don't boost that post now. Like, oh, this has got to get more engagement. Like I'm going to boost it. No, don't do that. Boost your unicorn. Like throw money at your unicorn or re make unicorn babies. Um, so Google Analytics, like you can get into a lot of different um, arenas there um, and, and really fine tune like what's happening on your website. Um, and so you're just watching the behavior um, of Google Analytics, like who um, and what pages they're going to, and then how are they getting there? Or if your organic reach isn't that great or uh, organic search, well, you need to start making more posts on Vell Valley Partnerships blog page because Google loves chambers. We have legitimate businesses. So um, you just as a member, you can post a blog and then link to your website. And that's already like, get, it's called a cross link. Um, so you, you can really see where people are coming from. Is it a referral? Um, you know, is it coming from Vell Daily? Is it coming from a, a partner of yours? Um, and so y'all are sharing each other's links and then social. Um, you'd be surprised social rarely get, I mean, social is like building the culture, it's building the brand, um, but um, realistically you're not, most of your traffic is coming from organic search or direct, like I know to go to uh, velvalleypartnership.com, right? So um, I, you can get real nerdy in it, um, but don't, don't take it too far, right? Like you don't need to overanalyze it, just see it for what it is and, and then maybe design some um, content around that. And interestingly, I just learned something um, when we talk about organic search and you know that's what people type in, what people type into Google, that if I'm trying to find keywords as to what people are searching for, if I just start typing the word in there, so if I type the word nonprofit into the Google search, it'll come up and show me suggestions of what people have been searching for. So for those of you in a nonprofit that just wanna know, you know, what are people searching for around, um, you know, women and biking or the environment or rivers or whatever, if you just put those words in there and then you get all these suggestions that can give you a jumping off point so that then you can um, do more analytics about, you know, what are people searching for and what do you want to buy ads for? You know, and I just wanted to talk about the, the practical application of Google Analytics, because I know that for some non-tech people, it can seem really unwieldy. So what do you do? Um, you know, if you have a web person or an IT person, they can help you install the little bit snippet of code that you need into your website to be tracking everybody. So if you don't know how to do that, you know, again, use your resources in the community to help you, to help you do that. Um, and then once you start collecting data, well, how do you read it? Um, I don't know if you've ever been into Google Analytics, but it can seem daunting. It's, there's a lot of data in there 
And if you don't know where to look for it, um, it may be difficult to find. So there's a lot of resources, you know, there's video tutorials on YouTube and Vimeo on how to find the information that you're looking for. So I would say, you know, simply Googling analytics, uh, Google analytics, how to is a great way to, to find out how to do that. And then there's also some um, tutorials within Google analytics to, to show you how you can find data. Yeah, Great advice, message. and I will totally agree with that. I say I think the big message is use data wherever you are getting it from, because marketing is an experiment. It's a risk every time you put something out there. The point is, are you learning from the risk when you post something? Are you looking if it worked or not? And, and yes, Google Analytics can be very advanced. You can go simpler if you look at the analytics of your MailChimp, if you send out a newsletter or a blog they have a, it automatically creates a report on the effectiveness of it if you use a social um, scheduling platform we use buffer it has analytics built into it so it can be it can be quite simple and we basically look at for the highs and the lows and, and when you're tracking where do people click on the website we say were our usage number of viewers per month up or down? Uh, how long were they on the page? And what were the top five pages they went to? So sometimes people get so focused on generating new content all the time, it's exhausting. What pages are people actually looking at on your website? Do you need all those sub navs, tertiary navs, or can you reduce it? So you can look at from click to click to click where they drove on the site and focus your efforts in those, in those areas. And then it also tells you how they got to the site. So if we're spending all this time on social media, how many clicks over or what percentage of your readers that come to your site came from social media? Is it really warranted to do four posts a week? So look at, look at where you wanna spend your time and your money and your efforts. And when you have the time, you know, you can hire. I learned from my, my Boulder interns. She is a certified Google Analytics. You know, she can run circles around me. So for the leadership team, you need to generally understand and say, here are my goals. Here's the strategy. Now tell me what to do. And that is attainable to hire someone for a short contract or to get an intern or whatever it might be. Um, it's, it's possible, but I think that it, that is the big beast is Google Analytics. So don't, don't let it overwhelm you. And so what about um, YouTube and when we're talking about videos? So a lot of nonprofits, you know, they'll, they may post their videos on Vimeo. They may post them on YouTube. And my experience is because of the relationship between Google and YouTube, that you know we're we're better off posting them on YouTube. Do you all have any advice as to which way we should go with those and how we should position those videos? I, you know, I find um, I'll get on my horse a little bit, but you know, sometimes with YouTube, I think that um, we struggle with this as an organization because we post a lot of video to our own website and. YouTube is is obviously it's a um, it's a for profit business and they're trying to make money, and so they're pushing content out that is popular that goes viral, and so that it reaches a larger audience. And a lot of times, what we're posting is not going viral, and we're not reaching that audience that we want to reach. So I think we have to think about it, just posting a video uh, on YouTube or any other place is really not a panacea. We need to market our video. So if, if you have um, something that you've created, you know, particularly if it's something longer, uh, like a documentary that you're really proud of, you, know, you can create a premiere for it. You know, your post that, you know, maybe doing YouTube live and you set a time for people to tune in and watch it and you write a press release and you let people know about it in the newspaper. You write a blog post, say, check it out uh, here at this time. You can create a trailer for it so that people get excited about it. So it's something real short, 15 seconds, you know, tune in on Friday night at, at eight o'clock to watch. Um, so 
I, I really, I see this from nonprofits a lot that just create video and then it just goes out there and it, it doesn't get a lot, whole lot of attention because they sort of miss the fact that it's, it doesn't exist on its own in a vacuum. It has to be, you have to market the video uh, as well, particularly if it's, if it's a longer piece. Um, when you have some of these shorter things, these short sort of 15 second hits, you know, we don't need to market those. It's just getting them out on social media is, is great in and of itself. Um, so, you know, and think about who you're trying to reach. Remember when we put things out into YouTube, we're reaching sort of a national global audience. And in a lot of cases, we're trying to reach local people um, people in our community. So is it going to get lost on YouTube? I mean, there's billions of videos on YouTube. So how do you make sure that you get it in front of people? And, um, you know, local access TV is always a great way to do that, whether here or in other places, you can get it in front of local folks. Um, it's a great place to, um, to reach out to your community. Yeah. Ben? Okay, good. <laughs> YouTube, Vimeo, what, tell us what your opinion is. We, I like Vimeo uh, for its showcases. It's a little more polished um, and especially for the local audience, um, like JK was mentioning. Um, Vimeo just, it makes it feel like a place that you want to watch videos, whereas like who knows what you're going to find on YouTube. Um, Vimeo is more, I think, around stories. Um, YouTube is more around content, but it has both, right? It has everything. I mean, what you have to know is that YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world um, behind Google. So, I mean, it's as powerful as it, as it seems. Um, but yeah, you're, I've, I've, my sentiments are the same with uh, JK's. It, it's it's a national, international audience, um, but maybe, maybe it, it's good for your uh, SEO, you know, reverting to your, um, back to your website. And it's certainly easy, Vimeo or YouTube, um, you know, just pick one and stick with it, um, but you can um, put it on your website, right? It's super easy to embed the link or, um, or even the code um, if you're savvy enough to, like just hit the HTML button and put it in. Um, and you can, I know with uh, Vimeo, you can take off the icons or, or add on the icons that you want. So you can make it look a little bit more like you want. Whereas YouTube, I think it's, you're, you're guaranteed to have the YouTube uh, kind of click button. But um, yeah, I, I think that showcase is kind of neat those like your channels and, YouTube has playlists, um, but at the partnership, you know, this YouTube just added the playlists and, and we were building the showcases and we can f uh, send out that feed for the showcase um, um, for that, you know, whether it's for nonprofits, okay, or, or it's our education series. Um, so we can put it in that showcase and then share that feed so that it populates every single time we put up a new uh, video for that showcase. Um, so if it's an educational series or a nonprofit showcase, um, we, we do this nonprofit network, we put it on the recorded file onto Vimeo, and now it's within the playlist on our website. Okay, so the showcase piece, is that a YouTube feature or is that a feature on your website? That's uh, Vimeo. Oh, that's a Vimeo feature. Okay, and so a similar feature on YouTube is the playlist. Is that correct? Correct, and um, I haven't played around with it enough to to give you an ed educated uh, answer to to how you use that. But um, it seems similar. But uh, you know, the showcase is just allowing you to get that feed, that very specific feed, maybe on a very specific page that you have. Right, and, and with the playlists and YouTube, um, I think people still have to come to your YouTube page, your YouTube channel, and then they have to click on playlists. So I don't think you can give them a, just a link. You all may know better than I do, but I don't know if you can just give them a link to that playlist. And so now they're still wading through 
your videos to try to figure out, you know, what video do I want to see? Right. And your, your goal is to keep people on your website, not send them to YouTube. So, um, cause you will get distracted. If you go to YouTube, you'll watch something else, I'm sure. But, um, yeah, that showcase, that's what I'm not quite sure, but it seems to me that you can only watch the playlist on YouTube. So keep them on your website. If you want to keep on your website, um, you know, I would recommend Vimeo than YouTube. And Joe just made a comment that YouTube may display an ad before or after your video. And so a lot of people, I think that um, irritates them and they click away because they, you know, they have to watch that ad for 11 seconds or whatever when you can punch skip this ad. So, um, so Claire, do you have a, a, a weigh in Vimeo, YouTube, both, either? I, I'm going to defer to the video fellas. No, I, it's not my wheelhouse. I, Sacred Cycle did create a channel on YouTube. I have a branding client through Collisome that has a channel on Vimeo. So I use both. I do actively use them. I encourage placing videos in your newsletters and, and it's very easy. You copy the link off of YouTube or Vimeo and it has a, a plugin layout. So I, we, we know videos are effective. We did do a um, 30 day campaign last fall and had, a, I don't know, 12 or 18 videos created in a 30 day period. And for this, I had a, a lot of contractors, volunteers working on it. And we chose, you have to think about, again, what is the caliber of the video? Sometimes there's a, it's just for Instagram stories. Sometimes it's a vlog, but it can still be casual. And sometimes it warrants being on your website or and or in a playlist. So be strategic on, on the duration, the quality, the messaging of it, all that, all that sort of stuff. So that, just, go ahead. I was just going to just going to plug high five a little bit too and say that high fives even you know another service that locally um, you know we have our own video service that we use that we can upload your video to to display it to the community and one of the other things that we do is that when we usually when we get like four um, videos from a nonprofit and that's either you're submitting it to us and we're putting it on our website or you're asking us to pull it in uh, and embed it on our site from YouTube or Vimeo um, we'll um, make a page for you for your nonprofit and have it on our website and so really what you're doing is, um, yeah, you're helping high five, but you're creating a clearinghouse of local videos. So the idea is, is that, you know, we see something um, from one organization and then we get, see uh, a video below that uh, from another organization and we kind of help one another and um, develop in, interest and advocacy um, among ourselves. So it's a great, you know, I think community resource um, uh, to have uh, and uh, yet another way to, to reach folks. Great. Okay, so we're going to open it up for questions here in, in a couple of minutes. Um, we have about 15 minutes left. So if you all have questions, if you want to put them in the chat box or you can raise your hand and, and I'll, I'll call on you, you can unmute yourself. Um, but one question is, is our cell phone okay to video or do we need uh, video equipment or, um, you know, JK, I'm sure you can weigh in on this one um, as to what kind of quality, because Claire just mentioned, you know, good quality. Sorry, I, I was muted. Um, yeah, I think we always want to strive to do the best we can as far as, as quality is concerned. Um, me working at an access center, I, I feel like quality shouldn't necessary, necessarily be a barrier to um, getting the word out about an organization. So I don't necessarily harp on quality, although we want to try to do the, the, the best that we can. Um, yeah, I think that if, if we want to, you know, say, use our smartphones to capture video, I think that that's a great idea. Um, you know, it helps if you have a, a newer model um, uh, camera that you can do video with and you can control exposure with. Um, you, it also helps to have a microphone. Um, you know, we think about um, video and it's, um, it's great, but you can have the, the prettiest, slickest looking video. And if the audio is, um, if you can't understand it, 
people will turn it off right away. There's been studies that have proven that people won't necessarily turn off bad video as long as the audio is good, but they will turn it off if you have bad audio. So make sure you have a microphone. I would also say, you know, lighting, make sure you have good lighting. One of the easiest ways that we can, that we have good lighting, especially here in the mountains, is go out and shoot early in the morning and late in the afternoon, right around sunrise and sunset. It creates beautiful lighting. You can have beautiful images. It's easy. You don't have to set up lights. Um, and then also, you know, come up with a, a script or an outline, you know, that really kind of ticks through what you want to say so that you can help visualize what your end product is like. Don't just jump into it um, to do a video for video's sake. Think about your message beforehand, who you're going to be maybe interviewing, the B-roll um, that you're going to be capturing to show to illustrate what someone is talking about. Um, another thing that I always ask nonprofits to do is um, you're probably already collecting photos of your from your organization and maybe you've got them stowed on a hard drive somewhere. Do the same for video. And when you have an event, capture video at it because you may come around to next year and you wanna do a video about your event, event in advance and you don't have any video about it. But if you're doing it as you go, you can sort of help fill in the gaps for, for video pieces uh, like that. Um, and, and going back to, well, great, you know, I've got my smartphone and I got my microphone. Well, how do I make a, a decent image? Well, there's a lot of resources out there, you know, on how to frame an image, you know, which is what, how we look in, you know, in our little Zoom box right now, that's our framing. So we can, you can look for tutorials or find workshops about that and you know how to have good color, good lighting, all of that. So do that before you actually go out and start capturing video. Um, look, at, look at a few of those tutorials. Great. I, um, I would say that JK nailed it. Um, you know, when you're, you, we have the technology now that is just incredible with our phones. So um, there's a difference between, um, you know, content and then a story, right? And so when you're out there at, at one of your events or you're, you know, running a program, get somebody, anybody that has a good, that probably find someone who has a high quality phone or the latest and greatest phone because the cameras have just improved that much more. And just like do like a, a slow panning shot um, and, and like do like the far away scene setting, like here's your subject and then really close, especially if somebody's crying or laughing or, or smiling faces, like you're humanizing this story, right? Um, but the content piece can be behind the scenes, like check out our cycle effect like program day um, all these girls are riding bikes, like short little like pan video, well, or competition. And then now we have, like JK said, this archive that you can build on and we can refer to. So if you watch a, a lot of documentaries, they're, they have like filler, a lot of filler stuff. And a lot of it's like black and white photos and things that you do the Ken Burns effect, just slight motion. So you're, you're helping tell that story and, and really, um you know if you wanted to and it takes it takes video takes time like to edit the story but the technology is there where um i just got the uh, road mic go 2 that you plug into your phone and uh, there's two transmitters so two microphones um that can come um and um from two different people maybe you're doing an interview and it's a live segment and you're getting some of this live and recorded um and then the the receiver end is onto your phone so you're recording and then you have two people with microphones and um you have these earbuds um you have the bluetooth earbuds um if someone's going live from your organization and just talking so use the technology and then that's when you would hire a video production company um, to say like, okay, 
we're not video experts. We don't know exactly how to tell this story. Here's our end goal. This is what we're trying to do and accomplish. Let the videographers like help you come up with that storyline. And, and then you have content to fill within it. But the audio, like JK said, is the most important. That story, it, that like concept of story and bullet points is the most important thing that you can do. Great, thanks. And Claire made a request here for the last few minutes. If you all have a camera and you can turn it on just so that she can see your smiling face and say hello in the grocery store. Um, okay, so here's a question. Um, and and uh, Addie, thanks for asking this because um, I, I was thinking this too. So any suggestions for the new Clubhouse app and generating a broader conversation in there. And a lot of the groups I'm in, we've had a lot of conversation around Clubhouse. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's this new social media site where you can go in and create a room and then you can get up on stage and then you go back into the audience. And you know that might not be the best description for that, but um, <laughs> any, any comments on Clubhouse? I have not dove in yet. I got to tell you, I'm looking at bandwidth. So not for me, not yet. Either hey, one. I'm not familiar. Okay. I've, I've heard about it, but maybe someone in the audience can speak to it. Yeah, yeah. you have to be invited. And so if somebody invites you into this group and then, you know, um, they can promote you to the stage and it, yeah, it, um, you can go on and read about it. But, um, but yeah, right now, um, you know, I'm in the National Speakers Association. There's lots of talk going on right now. And some people have invited me to come in and, and Claire, like you, I'm like, Ugh. I just don't have the bandwidth to do that right now. So, um, okay, another video question. Um, what about time length on the video? You know, I think that we've been moving to shorter and shorter videos um, as we go. Um, I think our attention spans are so short anymore uh, that, you know, we've seen that short videos are effective. So, uh, you know, sometimes we're just doing easy little 15 second, even 10 second um, little hits uh, for, for, for short things. Um, but even when we're doing longer things, um, if we're doing little documentaries, you know, five minutes maybe, um, if you're doing something more involved, like even if you're doing like a, like a virtual fundraiser or a gala, keep it short. Um, I think that it's really easy in this day and age in, in this sort of setting where we're all remote for someone to, you know, walk away and grab a glass of wine or, you know, watch the newest episode of the Queen's Gambit. So it's, it's really important to keep things short and um, keep it easy for them. And I have some thoughts on Addie's question too, if, um, after everybody else talks about this one. I just have an um, add on to, I think, Ben, JK, around length, but also just assets of video. So work your way into it. I, you know, I'll be authentic. I would love to hire Ben and capture the action from Sacred Cycle. You don't have the budget. And so realistically, you know, prior to 2019, we had zero photos, zero video assets. It took me an entire calendar year of programming and we filmed and shot every single thing where people were so annoyed with me that I always had it attached to me. And now we have part of our system that someone is assigned every community ride to photograph it. We send someone ahead on the trail to get the video out. So work your way into it. We did hire Capture the Action last fall for an event that we had. And fortunately also our keynote speaker who wanted it recorded, she supplemented it and paid for it as well. So not only did we shoot the event and we invested in a live stream so that we had a larger audience, but we also had them shoot B-roll. And, and you know she has used the, the keynote portion of it, but the, the beauty of having, um, we used a, a community panel of experts is the content there is way worth the value of the financial investment in it. So you know, continually, ongoingly, we look at that and say, we're gonna extract 15 seconds, two minutes, 
whatever it is. And, and the folks that we had as part of the event, we've shared that you know with them as well. So look at really, I'm always look managing budgets. Where is the money coming from? Split it across different buckets so it doesn't feel like such a heavy hit. Yeah, and I think you know with the budget piece, it's knowing how much a video will cost um, so that you can plan for it in the future. And um, you know, there's we we have a network of videographers here. Joe Kanye, I see, is on here. Um, JK, of course, like High Five Media, they're excellent with their craft and then um, capture the action. And we just, we know of other videographers. So if we can't do something or we're too high on budget, we can refer you and, but the, the, the link. So um, a minute and a half, if it's like kind of short testimonial, like fun stuff, social media content, like I would say a minute and a half is like what I try to shoot for. Um, if it's a gala type event, um, you know, like uh, JK said, five minutes is, is a good mark to kind of be on to tell the story. Now, I am a big, uh, like, I don't want a story to end uh, quickly and abruptly. I want a beginning, middle, and end. I want you to feel all the feels. I want you to laugh. I want you to cry. And I want you to go and, and be inspired um, to go, like, um, have that behavior change or go be a part of this nonprofit. Um, and so, you know, if a story, if there's so many elements within a story that you can't figure out how to take it out, don't take it out, leave it. Like it's, it's an amazing story. And sometimes I can tell you a quick story or I can expand and tell you a long story. Now there's a difference between providing too many details that doesn't really matter versus like you need to know this like you have to know this you have to know this and and so like one uh documentary film that i just watched uh is on amazon prime called muscle shoals and it is the coolest uh music like documentary and it's about a place in alabama and 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 there's just so many uh, layers and elements to it so it's a two-hour documentary but sometimes you know if you like a lot of times what we show for here locally, y'all don't have the budget to have us, you know, do a two hour documentary. Right. But we're, we're good at telling that story and we want to tell the complete story. So don't like have a, have a goal in mind, but if we, if the story means that we got to go past it, let it go. Great. Thanks, Ben. And JK, you wanted to answer Addie's question and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, just from my past experience coming from the inside as being a, a reporter uh, at various newspapers across the country, um, I think, you know, the easier that you can make a reporter's life, the better. So if you have a well-written press release, hey, that's great. Think about, um, you know, if you're pitching them a story, really think it through and, you know, find a hook for it you know, as journalists, we've, you know, seen a lot, covered a lot of stories. And so I think we all get kind of jaded. So you have to sort of have a little bit of a unique um, take on whatever your story is. And again, I think it goes back to having it be a human interest um, uh, angle um, and be persistent, you know, that um, we're all busy people, you know, and I believe in being persistent and just, you know, if you don't hear anything, keep reaching out to them and then really um, um, develop those relationships, develop relationships with reporters, you know, that are outside of the Valley and nurture those like you would a volunteer or a donor um, and stay in touch with them. Great. Thank you. All right. One last question for the three of you. If you could raise, if you could wave your magic wand and could bestow one thing on nonprofits to help them be successful, what would it be? I'm gonna go with my three adjectives, consistent, memorable, and polished. Mm -hmm. Be empathetic to your volunteers bandwidth, um, meet them where, where they are at, and um, just be um, strategic in your execution. Awesome. Ben? Um, this is in general for a nonprofit or for media? Yeah, just. 
Um, know your story, know your why. Um, I think that's probably the most important uh, piece. Um, celebrate, celebrate your staff, um, celebrate your, the people that you serve um, with humor and, and joy, uh, bring that as much as possible and um, be creative. Um, be creative on, on your donor outreach. How does that look at, you know, Katie is on here, Katie's in um, from Access Unbound. And um, she came up with a really creative uh, program uh, working with businesses. And it, it was like a, a card, um, a locals discount card. And so like what other thing, like Grand Hyatt is doing uh, gestures days with um, a nonprofit and building events, which we're all ready to have again. So just be creative in who you get to work with and share your story with. Great. Thanks, Ben. How about you, JK? You could wave your magic wand. What would well, you- I, I think Ben and Claire really, really, really hit the, hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, I think it's, you know, finding those stories about the people who you serve and telling those stories. And beyond that, you know, it'd be nice to have a couple extra dollars in the budget to help hire someone who is a marketing person to do this stuff. <laughs> right. I think a lot of us can <laughs> underscore that. So let's give our panel a big hand and you can give them high fives up and down sideways with your cube here. Um, you all have been wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. And next, next um, nonprofit learning series is on May 4th at 9 a.m. We have a strategic planning panel with Chris Romer, Vel CEO of Vail Valley Partnership. We have Barb Waters, who's a business management. And then there's one other person who um, I'm waiting on confirmation. He just wrote a book on strategic planning for nonprofits. So we're waiting on that. And thank you all for being here. And uh, please, if you have any other questions, let me know. I can pass them on to the panel. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you, everyone. Us. Thank Bye. you for participating. Thank you. Send your videos to High Five Media. <laughs> <laughs>